All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to my session of the M365 May conference. I'm very excited to be presenting this. Um, seem to be doing a lot of these online conferences, so it's good to connect with all of you. It's a shame we couldn't do it in person, but I think this is a an equally great platform to do it as well. So um, I will maybe we just switch to slides and then we can get straight into it. I'm probably uh, would ask that we save questions. Please put questions in the chat all the way through, but I'll save those to the end because I have a lot of stuff that I want to um, I want to cover and I'm, I'm happy to stay on after the call if you want to do questions or, or follow up separately. So but please put them in throughout the chat as we go. Um, so firstly, you know, welcome uh, to my fellow speakers and also participants. And I just want to acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the land that we're on both here and, and in Australia and pay respect, respect to those elders. Um, I also just want to quickly highlight the um, the code of conduct for this conference. So, you know, I, I'm going to personally try and be very constructive and respectful and try and be helpful. And I would ask that you guys uh, add that as well to each other and to the other speakers throughout the conference as well. OK, so we're here today to talk about the art of deep work in mostly mostly Microsoft 365. Uh, and I say this because as I've been working on this, particularly over the last few months, it's this talk has evolved a little bit. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll sort of duck and weave throughout certain things, but I really want to share, I guess, my journey of 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 learning to do deep work and then how I apply that inside the Microsoft 365 set of tools. Now, uh, for those who don't know me, um, hello, uh, it's very nice to meet you. My name is Angus Florence and I am based in Melbourne. Uh, I live with my wife and two, two lovely kids who I'm enjoying spending ample amounts of quality time with at the moment. So that's been a lot of fun. Um, I work for Microsoft and I'm part of the Microsoft 365 product marketing team. Uh, I look after a little product called Yammer and I've been I've been in this role in this particular role for about four and a half years now but at Microsoft for almost nine. Um, uh, my role is a it's a global role so it's technically based in the US but I was very lucky enough to convince them that I was uh, I should be should definitely come back to Melbourne and they agreed and, and so I, I now work for Melbourne but in a global role so most of my in fact all my team is in the US and I try and do US hours, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, I came to Microsoft uh, by a Yammer acquisition. So I used to work for Yammer way back in the day. Uh, I joined Yammer in January 2012, and um, I was a customer success manager uh, for APAC way back then. And, and on my first day there, my manager at the time, a guy by the name of Ross Hill, uh, gave me a book called Getting Things Done. By David Allen and said basically you know everything you need to know about this job and what you need to do is in this book. I was like okay that's interesting you know I've always I guess I've always been interested I wouldn't say in productivity but I guess in just doing things more efficiently and effectively and so um, when I saw this book I thought oh, this might be interesting I can I can get into this but if I'm perfectly honest it took me two years to even open it so it wasn't until about 2014 but I did read this book and then uh, light bulbs went off everywhere. I was like, oh my God, it's actually, you know, as common sense as it sounds about, you know, trying to be more productive and getting um, value from your time and, your, and where you spend your attention, um, having these frameworks really helped me. And that, that kicked off a few different things, but I sort of point that as the start of my journey. And then uh, in, uh, it must've been May of 2015, at the first Ignite conference in Chicago, uh, colleagues of mine, Steve Wynn on the left and Steve Summers on the right and myself ran a session about becoming productivity ninjas. Uh, and we talked about, um, you know, at the time, the different tools available in, in Office 365 and not only that, but you know, other tools as well and how each of us use them. We, we all worked very differently. We're all scattered apart different parts of the world. and. Um, and shared our best practice and it was a really well received session and, and it taught me a lot from how the other two guys worked and there's obviously a whole community of people out there as well which I started to get plugged into and you know I've we've kept this conversation going you know the last five years and we're constantly trying to improve the way I work the uh, where I spend my time how I focus on things uh, what's important to me all that type of stuff and so 
that kind of um, leads me to what I wanted to talk about today, which is this concept of deep work. And deep work is actually a book uh, by a guy called Cal Newport, who's um, you know, probably my, I would say my man crush. Anyone who's talked to me about this stuff in the last 12 months would be lucky to escape me mentioning Cal. Um, I'm only new to his work, but I'm a very, very big fan. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go. Now, this session, I guess, is really, I'm not gonna go into, into any great depth around deep work, pardon the pun. Um, uh, what I really wanna do is just share, I guess, my journey, my experience, my learning as I've sort of gone through this, uh, what I've learned, what works, what doesn't work. I am by no means an expert at this. I think I'm only at the very beginning of my journey, uh, but I just wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, it's also, I think, a great opportunity for me to present and not talk about Yammer. And so I'm also you know, pretty excited about that as well. Um, before I get into it, I just want to, I guess, put a few caveats up there before we go. So, yeah, I think uh, Lorian, when he first reached out to me to present at this session, it was going to be a Saturday in May, and I was, at the time, I was actually pretty skeptical about giving up my Saturdays. But uh, when I asked if I could talk about something other than Yammer, uh, I got excited by it. But I, I guess at the time, it was very different to the world we live in now. And in fact, in fact, our friend Andy Bernard, I think, said it best when, you know, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. And certainly when I sort of planned this out, at least in my mind, what this session would be about, it was a very different world than what we live in now. Um, and um, if you're a parent at home at the moment with kids, you know, this idea of nine to five doesn't exist anymore, uh, at least currently. I think we'll go back uh, to this point soon, but I, I guess as we go through this presentation, I'll show you, show you things. Just bear in mind that I think, you know, obviously the world we're in right this very moment is very different and hopefully not forever. I think some things will change for good uh, and for the good, um, but also I think some things will go back to normal relatively soon as well. So take it with a grain of salt what I'm saying, because I know a lot of this stuff right now is probably not going to make sense. And even for me, you know, personally, it can be incredibly frustrating when you care so much about productivity and where you spend time. You know, the, the interruptions and distractions we have at the moment are, are nuts. Uh, and we all unfortunately can't be as uh, as clever as Lorian, where he can now clone himself and get all his tasks done very quickly. So we have to manage the, the precious time and resource we have and to make sure that we spend that time doing things that can truly bring value, not just to ourselves or our families, but I think also to our companies and customers. Uh, again, I said it earlier, this is for me very much the beginning of the journey. You know, I've, I've been doing this, I guess, on and off now for six to 12 months, maybe two years in some cases, but I think I'm still very much at the start. Uh, really today, I just want to share my experience, my learning uh, and, I, you know, things that have worked for me. This is not preaching. I don't expect anyone to drop anything that they're doing and follow this, but I think it's a really interesting conversation to have. And particularly in light of everything that's happening now, I think people are going to change the way they work forever hopefully for the good and so if we can if i can help share some of my experience and make that a bit easier for people that'd be great um just about the tools that i'll go through today uh, i guess you know so i do work for microsoft but this is by no means a microsoft presentation um i'm going to show you i did plan on doing this through you know demo tenants and fake accounts but it just wasn't authentic so i'm going to be showing you my real you know, my real calendars, my real inboxes, everything I do. So um, I've, I've sort of blacked out and redacted things to protect the innocent. But there might also be things that you see that maybe you don't have in your tenant. Maybe I have access to them. And to be quite honest, I've lost track of what's publicly available in some of this stuff and what I have access to. Um, but hopefully, if, if you don't have it yet, you might get it soon. So just keep that in mind. And, and if you don't have this exact thing that I have, maybe, maybe soon you'll get it. And then finally, you know, it would be remiss of me to not recognize the fact that I am in a fairly unique and lucky situation in how I work with regard to deep work, I think. Being, having your entire team literally on the other side of the planet, um, there's certainly some difficult parts of that, but there's also a ton of benefits when you want to, when you think about focus and attention. And so, the, you know, I get up, I start my day roughly at six o'clock, my working hours begin 6 a.m. And most of my meetings happen in the morning, but by lunchtime for me, most of my colleagues are gone. Um, you know, knocked off for the day. Mondays is obviously very quiet for me because it's Sunday in the US. And so I, you know, I don't take for granted the fact that I do have probably more, uh, um, not free time, but more time to focus on work than maybe a lot of other people do that are constantly distracted. But again, this is 
I guess my story, your mileage will definitely vary from this, but um, I, hopefully some of the things I show you might be able to implement. All right, so let's quickly talk about deep work and my my main man, Cal Newport, who I'm a big fan of. You can see Cal's pretty young. He's a professor at the, I think the University of what, Georgetown and Washington DC, I believe. And he's written you know, five or six books and he's only like 35 or something. It's crazy. This guy can literally get stuff done. But anyway, I, I discovered him uh, last year while I was listening to a podcast about something and it, it, some of the stuff he, he was talking about really resonated with me. And he, and I read three of his books last year uh, and they all sort of follow into one another. The first one on the left being, you know, so good they can't ignore you is really about, um, you know, people have this idea that if you follow your passion, you'll be successful. And and he sort of tries to debunk that myth and you know, follow. He generally thinks that following your passion is bad advice. And what you should really be doing instead is is becoming really good at certain things, certain skills, and eventually they become your passion. And he has really good examples around people like, you know, Steve Jobs. You know, he wasn't passionate about building a phone, but you know, through his work and his skills, he he developed that sort of stuff. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to to think about stuff. Uh, and then to follow on from that, the next part of that is okay. If you want to develop your skills around a specific thing and be really good at it, and so people can't ignore you, whether that's your, you know, your boss, your family, or your friends, or sports, whatever it is, like how do you do that? And this is where this concept of deep work came about. It's like the only way you're going to get better at something is by spending a lot of time focusing on it and being good at it. And so deep work is really about the ability to focus without dis distraction. And that's becoming increasingly valuable in our society, particularly in these big companies, these big information companies. So th that book was really around um, how to hone that skill. I'll talk a little bit about today. And then the last one, which I think I'll also cover briefly, is around this idea of digital minimalism. Because if you want to do deep work and focus work on a particular thing, particularly today, you know, how do you focus in a world that is literally as noisy as it's ever been, whether it's social media phones like the technology around us is constantly interrupting and vying for our attention and so if we want to if you work backwards if we want to do deep work and be good at something so people can't ignore us we need to get rid of these distractions in our lives and make sure we have that time to focus and so um i found these three books really really interesting probably my three favorite uh, that i read last year um, and so today i want to cover the, these sort of these last two in a little bit more detail so if you think about deep work, let's talk about the opposite. What's shallow work and you know, the work that we do day to day? Uh, and I think and this is, again, certainly my perspective. I could I could see a lot of, sh I was doing a lot of shallow work without even really thinking about it. And that's things like tasks that don't create a ton of new value. Uh, they're easy to replicate and you can do, you know, almost with your eyes closed. Think about even just uh, maybe a bad example, driving to work. But you know how you can drive somewhere and not necessarily know how you did it. It's just a, it's a thing that's built into you. And, you know, there's, I've talked in the past about this idea of being busy versus being productive. And we can spend a lot of our time being incredibly busy all the time. But at the end of the week, it's like, what have you got to show for it? Might, you might have a nice clean inbox and you've ticked off some things. But, you know, if we spend all our time doing email, replying to Teams messages, going to meetings, we're not actually getting any real work done. And so we kind of term this as shallow work and we want to try and do less and less of that but i think it's important first to acknowledge what shallow work is and then the opposite of that i guess is this concept of deep work this is where you can do things that actually create new value and are very hard to replicate you can't automate these type of things they make you these sort of tasks and this work really makes you use your brain and your cognitive abilities and you have to focus very hard on something and generally you need to do these free from distraction you need to spend you know a good one to two to three hours on these things and and then once you do these things though then you become much better at it like i said something you got to practice so cal talks about these he's got four sort of pretty rules or principles about how to do this and again my experience is like it's very hard to do all four and i tend to vary back and forth depending on what i'm trying to do but um i won't take you through what those are so the first one is around the first rule is around you know to work deeply and at a high level what that really means is yeah you, know, you have to be relatively aggressive about protecting your time for deep work so when I, like and you'll see how i do this in my day-to-day -day with my calendar and other things you want to make sure that you know you have these particular rituals and routines that allow you to really focus on certain things throughout the day that you know isn't getting eaten up by shallow work um one that i enjoy and i think i'm probably the the most 
um, skilled at is this idea of being able to embrace boredom, which I, is really important. Uh, and deep work is a very hard skill, I think, to get good at. I certainly am not good at it yet. Um, we all assume that we know how to focus. I think we always say we can spend more time. I just need more time. But I think uh, that actually requires, in my experience, it requires a lot of practice. And so if, I, if you want to be serious about deep work, I think you have to um, get serious about training your ability to focus. So not get distracted, you know, not look for distractions almost. You know, and I found myself doing that all the time. I would try and find uh, distractions from stuff. This is somewhat controversial, but I think very important. And it's about quitting social media. And, you know, for me, I think to be serious about this, I had to quit social media. And thankfully, ironically, before I even read this book, I had done that. So I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in the coming up. But social media is by far one of our biggest distractors and we need to be well I needed to become much more selective about you know what I was going to let into my you know what Cal calls attention landscape um, and then <clears throat> the final rule is really about draining your shallows and that you know based on all the, the definition of shallows from before it's about all the non-deep work obligations that we have day to day how do we eliminate most of the ones that we can like once we don't do, just don't do them. And then the ones that remain, how do we become way more efficient at those so we can spend that more time and focus? And so th that's his rules. And I know they're kind of super high level. I'm not going to obviously read a whole book to you. So, you know, people ask me, okay, Gus, like explain to me like I'm five, why I would want to do deep work. And so I think, and, and this really resonated with me when I was doing research for this talk is I think that deep work truly is like a superpower. Uh, I'm by no means part of the Avengers in this yet, but I think I'm still working on it. Um, but it is a super, particularly in today's society, there's so much distraction and people who get distracted. I think it allows you to focus without distraction, distraction even in distracting situations. Um, and that's uh, even more relevant now, I think, than it probably never has uh, with everyone working from home. Um, Again, once you free your mind from those things, it really allows you to focus on super complicated things and add value to them uh, and, and do it quicker than you could. So the work that I, hopefully, the work that I've been outputting since trying to do this is coming in faster and is hopefully better than what I could have done, you know, by piecemealing stuff together over certain periods of time. And I think probably the most important thing for me is this idea of fulfillment. You know, we spend a third of our life working for someone else or for customers or for other people and like you know beyond the paycheck what are we doing this for and i think if you spend i was finding if i spent my entire week replying to other people's emails and teams chats and meetings and yammer stuff like it's not fulfilling like i might be helping people but being able to produce real deep work and share that with you know in my case with customers or you know, and see the impact that's having certainly gives you a sense of fulfillment more than just doing that, that shallow work task. So that's deep work in theory. I would certainly encourage you to, to jump in and, and read that book or any of those books if you get a chance. The other thing that I wasn't going to necessarily talk about, but I think it's interesting is I'm going to talk about digital minimalism, but I think it's worth talking about minimalism in our day-to-day -day lives. And my wife and I watched this documentary on Netflix uh, probably three or four years ago now. And you know, we constantly challenge each other to try and do less. And there is a really good feeling about minimizing certain parts of your life. I would equally say it's extremely difficult to be a minimalist with two young kids. And in fact, I'd say it's only impossible, regardless of what they say in the documentary. Um, but what's worked for me really well is there's a, there's a, a group of us uh, friends who sort of online, we, we pick a month of the year, maybe one or two times a year, we will have them, uh, we'll do a, a minimalist challenge. And what we do is you know, on the first day of the month, we'll have to throw, minimize one thing. On the second day, you minimize two things. And the third day, you minimize three things, which sounds pretty easy. But by the time you get to the end of the month and you have to try and work out how to throw away 26, 27, 28, 30 things a day, it actually gets quite hard. I don't think we've ever finished it um, completely. But, you know, this seems menial and dumb, but for me, you know, when thinking of the kitchen drawer as an example, this is a, the top drawer of my kitchen on the left. You have to open this 10, 15, 20 times a day. And it's just nuts. I'm sure we all have drawers like this in our house. And so by it, it seems small, but for me at least, again, I'm going to show you my story, seeing it on the right where it's clean and it makes sense, 
just frees your mind of these of this distraction or this like I don't know anger pain whatever it is is I had found I was going through the group and I found this one's obviously I have a real issue with top drawers there's another one that one on the right just is so calming to look at and and not because you can see my uggies and pajamas but um again I think it's a really interesting way to approach this we did other ones where I have video I don't think the sound's going to play anyway so this was you know we did a garage cleanup um when we moved back and that's the before on the left and then the on the right uh, was after which is still you know i'm by no means minimalist but it was certainly much cleaner that was and i even had room uh to set up my brewery which was you know that was the most important thing and i could do deep work about brewing beer so that's obviously important too so yeah it was just a, a small example of how we i'm trying to bring minimalist thinking and concepts into my life but also try and bring that into my work life which i think is probably where it's more interesting for the guys on the call so in terms of what i what i um use for work and i'm i'm always been a remote worker uh, at least for the last few years and so i've become pretty pretty good at what i need and what i don't need uh, and these are some of the things that i generally with the exception of my monitor and webcam pretty much take with me everywhere i go um i know i work for microsoft but I cannot underestimate my love for the Surface Pro laptops. Ah, sorry, the Surface laptops. I just think that they are incredible. Before this, my this is a, I have a Surface laptop too. Before this, I had a Surface Pro, and the whole like detachable keyboard and the and the even the keyboard itself just never worked for me. I could never quite get it to function the way I wanted it to. So I do I do love my Surface uh, laptop too, and it really helps me. You know, if I need to work from somewhere else or move, it's it's very good. Headphones, I think, are really important if you want to be able to focus your attention on certain tasks. Uh, I actually have two pairs. I have the noise cancelling ones uh, down the bottom right, but also just have a pair of um, AirPods. If I need to do a call or meeting outside or my phone, I can do a walking meeting with my AirPods. It's a bit easier. Bluetooth mouse, because we don't want USB things clogging up our single space. Um, and I also carry around a USB port because I do a lot of travel. So it's handy just to charge things in hotel rooms or when you're at customer sites, if you need to plug something in. Same with the dongles around displays and everything. Like having that is really handy. Now the monitor, again, I wouldn't require it, but because we've been planted for a while in, in my office, which I'll talk about later, I do have one. I wouldn't say it's a requirement, but it's nice to have. But certainly a decent webcam, I think, is really important. Uh, particularly for deep work, and I'll explain why that is in a, uh, a little bit later, but having a decent webcam um, really helps me concentrate, which might sound counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll talk about how that works soon. Now, all that stuff, with obviously with the exception of my monitor, fits very nicely into my bag, the notebook backpack that I carry around with me everywhere. And in fact, I can fit all that and usually about a week's worth of clothes with me if I'm traveling. Um, and anyone who knows me probably wouldn't be surprised with that because I have a very limited wardrobe. In fact, you're probably wearing maybe the exact same thing now that I was in that photo, so I can get away with uh, with fairly minimal clothing as I go everywhere. So that's the equipment stuff and the bag, but I, you know, it would be remiss one thing I did skip out intentionally because I want to dive a bit deeper is, is our mobile devices, which are, I think, by far the most distracting thing ever created, ever. Um, and, you know, really go against this idea of trying to um, well, actually, all they try and do is take your attention and time. And so certainly for many years, you know, I've, I've always been a techie. Like I always had the latest iPhone, all the apps, so many apps. I used to take pride in how many apps I would have on my phone. It was it was bizarre. And then as I've gone on this journey over the last few years, I've realized just the time suck and attention that these things take from you and take away from you for what's important. And so I've really tried to minimize um, how I use my phone. So I want to take you through that a little bit now. Um, the last phone I bought, which is still my own personal one, is uh, was a Android Pixel 2 XL, which I bought back in 2017. And um, I, for the last six to 12 months, I've been trying to really take advantage of this whole idea of this digital minimalism that Cal talks about. And actually, he has a challenge in his book, which I started this. And so I, um, I try and uninstall most of the uh, stock apps that come with the phone and install very little new apps on top. Uh, you can see on the right there, um, the only thing I really do is replace, I replace the text app with Signal, um, mostly for privacy, those type of things. I have LastPass for my passwords. I use ExpressVPN, I'm always connected to a VPN. 
and I have the Authenticator app because I need that to get into certain websites and everything. Uh, but besides that, I remove almost everything that I can from the phone and try and keep it very, very minimal. Now, that's not to say that it's like this all the time. Uh, depending on situations, I will install apps, but I, I try and keep that friction where I have to install it if I need it, and then I'll uninstall it once it's no longer needed. So examples of that might be things like banking apps if I need to transfer something or trip it or, or Uber or Lyft if I'm traveling, those type of things. Um, most times I can get away with just using browser apps. And so uh, you can even see Chrome has been disabled uh, currently, but I can just enable Chrome and then go to a browser app and go back. But just really helps, I guess, that minimize any distraction from my phone. I also, you might notice in the top row there, uh, most of the time during my work hours, at least, it's in do not disturb mode and I use favorite contacts. So, you know, my wife, kids' schools, um, babysitter, childcare, my boss, and a couple of key teammates are favorited. So, if they ever need me or text me, call me, it will come through. But generally, uh, I have do not disturb um, during the day if I can. So, really, my phone, the majority of the time, it's used for making phone calls, ironically. Sending a text message, I take some photos with it, I use it as a calculator, and then I have the uh, the clock app, which basically sets my alarm and gives me a timer for when I'm making the perfect stake because you've got to get those seconds exactly right. Now, I do have a work phone. You would have noticed in that last phone there was no work apps, and that's because I like to keep my work, at least from a phone perspective, my work life and my um, personal life separately. Uh, so I do have a work phone that they gave me, um, but to be perfectly honest, this stays mostly flat in my bag. Uh, I really only use it for a couple of key things. One being um, to do, if I'm doing a presentation at a conference or to customers, I'll do demos with it. Uh, maybe to take screenshots for some marketing stuff. Uh, or if I'm traveling somewhere and I'm on the go, instead of pulling my laptop out, I might use this to quickly go through email or you know reply to some team stuff. But generally speaking, I don't use this for much. Um, this one's obviously enrolled with the company in tune stuff and has all the different apps and tools you need for that. But um, yeah, try and, as you can see, try and keep this relatively minimal. People can always, you know, I've found this, I've been doing this for six to 12 months now. People can find me if they need me. Uh, and this is actually a, a, a chat we have internally called, it's actually called Digital Minimalism. There's four or five of us in there. We just share this stuff. And um, someone asked Steve Wynn, a colleague of mine, you know, do you do what Gus does and delete all your apps? He's like, no, no, I just, I just don't use them as often as so he limits his time using them versus apps, which I think is a great thing. Uh, my problem is I just can't do it. I'm, I'm weak and I have no self-control. And unless I physically remove the distraction from me, I will get distracted by it. And so, uh, particularly at the beginning. So once it's, once I say delete an app and I stop that habit of going to it after a while, I, even if I put the app back on to use it once, I, I don't find I go back to it as often as I used to. Um, so it's just about building those habits, but certainly, yeah, if you can limit your time yourself, awesome. But if you're like me, I'd actually remove it completely. Now, uh, I haven't mentioned yet um, social media, which is obviously the ultimate distraction and very, very bad for trying to do deep work. And so, like I mentioned earlier, I'm actually off. I, did, I got off Facebook and Instagram uh, a bit over two years ago now. Um, Twitter, probably about four or five months ago, beginning of the year, I got off Twitter. I am still on LinkedIn, um, mostly because... I couldn't work out how to get off it. <laughs> and yeah, Microsoft owns it and it, it might be helpful. Although I, I don't ever go to it. And I did log in today to get the screenshot and noticed it feels like it's mostly used by recruiters and startups who now run webinars for people who work from home. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of reasons why I got off social media and that's, and they've sort of evolved over the years. The initial one for me was really, I remember spending one, it must have been a Saturday morning or afternoon on the couch at home, flicking through Facebook and then feed and then Instagram and then back to Facebook. And, you know, realizing that I'm basically looking at pictures of other families and their kids and interesting stuff they do. And then looking up and seeing that I have two of my own that actually, you know, I like mostly more than other people's kids. And so what am I doing? Wasting my time on this. So pretty quickly, I just deleted them and got rid of distraction. And so it was really about, you know, trying to focus my attention. I don't think it's good for kids either to see to see me on the phone all the time. So that was probably the original reason, particularly for Facebook and Instagram. Um, 
around the same time, I also I found I kicked the habit for social media and then somehow took up the habit for reading news articles online, which is equally bizarre and, in fact, just causes so much outrage, at least for me. I just think the online news sources, uh, it's all clickbait. There's very little substance. Most of it's breaking news, so no one knows it's actually happened anyway. It's a headline. So I was finding myself becoming very outraged with everything going on without really getting any substance. So I, as of about February last year, I actually stopped reading or uh, looking at news, um, at least online. I do, you know, my wife and I will watch the, the news at night, um, at seven o'clock news, maybe on Ivy or something later on, but rarely, more so recently, just to check out everything that's going on with, you know, the virus and everything. But generally, yeah, you know, again, I don't necessarily feel like I'm missing out on anything. The news that I need to know somehow finds me. So, you know, that, that distraction I think has felt good and I certainly feel better for not being consistently outraged at everything that's going on in the world. There was obviously the whole Cambridge Analytica thing, which, again, I was already offered by that point, but certainly opened up um, a lot of people to that fact. There's a really good, I'm not going to talk about it heaps now, there's a really good documentary on Netflix about it, which I would encourage everyone to watch. Um, and if you can't give two hours for that, which is fair enough, um, in that documentary, Carol um, is in there a lot. and. She has a 15-minute TED Talk, which I think is really, really good and certainly interesting. And so I would encourage people to to watch that. Again, I don't expect you to change anything. I just thought it was really fascinating um, <clears throat> and certainly helped me, I think, justify why I wouldn't go back to social media, at least, from that way. And then actually last year I did read a book that was on Barack Obama's list around the age of surveillance capitalism. And this is really about how tech companies, the control they have. I always would dismiss it like, you know, it's just ads. And then if they're targeted to me, then it makes sense. You know, it doesn't bother me too much. But there's some pretty uh, alarming evidence about some of the stuff they can do, not just showing you ads, but changing and altering behavior and people's choices. And so I think there's some really, you know, what me not being on social media is not going to fix that. But I think there's some some good reasons not to be on there, at least for myself. So I would encourage it. It's a beast of a book, but I really enjoyed it. So why? You know, what does what does all this mean? I could spend a whole day, you could probably tell, talking about um social media and that type of thing but people ask me you know, do you feel good about it and i'm like generally i do yeah it feels like i it was it was i would admit it was hard at the start and i felt like i was maybe missing some things and there's a bit of a habit of pulling your phone out but once i got through that there is a sense of relief and a sense of not having to keep up with everything all the time and when you can let that go it is it is somewhat of a, of a relief um you know i still get you know my cousins will take a photo and text me the Facebook invites for their parties and stuff. So I don't miss out on anything like that, which is nice. And back in that uh, Teams group, you know, I was talking after I did um, talk about some of the stuff with the guys, someone asked me, you know, what have you noticed? You know, I guess your life is so much better now. And I don't know if I could say my life is better. I don't know if better is the right word to describe it, but certainly I found that where knowing where I spend my time and attention and doing that on other things that I think are more productive, like things like deep work is super valuable. And I, you know, last year alone, I read 34 books, which I don't think I've read 34 books in the, in the rest of my life before that. So, you know, I think um, when, once I realized that time and attention was the only thing you truly have, where you spend it becomes really, really important. All right, let's take a quick break, scan the code, I'm gonna take a sip, see if you can win some prizes. And now we're gonna get into the actual day-to-day -day stuff around uh, using, applying some of this stuff so you'll allow you to do deep work. Now, obviously before the current period in time, we spent a lot of time going to offices. You know, I have a uh, space so I can go and work from the desk at the Microsoft office inside Melbourne. When I came back from the US, you know, because I was doing US hours starting at six, that would basically, I live about 45 minutes from the city, which would mean, you know, I'd have to get up at 4.30, commute for 45 minutes, and then by the time I get to the office, it's an hour, do that twice a day. That's, you know, two hours a day of time that's lost, which I think was, people probably didn't think about. Now, I think maybe maybe people are realizing that that was a waste of time and you can get more stuff done. You know, sitting in traffic, I don't know, for me, I, I mean, as soon as I realized that time is the most precious thing you have wasting it on stuff like this seems crazy so there was a, there's a really good uh ted talk that a melbourne guy called steve uh San Martino does and I, I have the video on the presentation so you can watch it later but he basically talks about 
there's a little snippet here where he talks about offices were basically invented because they were considered a production asset. This is way back in like the seventies and things like photocopiers were incredibly expensive. So they would buy one and everyone would go to the office to use it. Uh, but we haven't moved away from that mentality for some reason, but what's interesting is last couple of months we have. And so I'll be, I'll be really curious as to what, um, what happens after that. So anyway, for what, so what I did is uh, once I settled back into the house here, I looked for a co-working space uh, somewhere nearby that I could work from. I don't necessarily enjoy working from home um, and that's been reinforced <laughs> over the last month or two. Uh, uh, so I, I joined a co-working space. It's five minutes from my house. Uh, I pay for this out of my own pocket. Michael doesn't pay for this, um, but I think the value that I've gotten from this far outweighs any cost out of my own pocket. Um, it gives me a sense of community. I'm actually surrounded by people. I'm still talking to people. It's social, but because I don't necessarily work with them, I also don't get that distraction of people coming up asking for certain things. Uh, so that's worked out quite well. And also, you know, being small, a lot of the recent stuff I've done in Yammer marketing, I've actually paid some of these local designers to do. So helping small business has been, been a, a win there as well. So this also gives me huge amounts of flexibility to you know, it'd be five minutes from home if I have to go and pick up the kids from school or duck home to find something. Just the amount of time saved doing this is, has been incredibly valuable. And in fact, uh, about a year ago, Lorraine, who's organized this conference, had a web series called Work From Home Warriors and he came down and we spent, you know, 20 minutes down there and took him through all that stuff. So I'd certainly look for that uh, presentation that we did. Now, let's get into the nuts and bolts. I want to show you how I actually get work done and focus and make sure I have time to do deep work each day. So you, much like my physical and real life, my digital on my laptop is super simple and minimalist. Um, the only thing that runs on my computer at startup is OneDrive. I live and die by OneDrive. I think it's pretty, pretty slick app. Um, it just does what it needs to do, particularly really well on Windows. I don't, um, I don't use many desktop apps most stuff i do is through a web browser so with the exception i use teams i use excel and powerpoint if i have to do some complex stuff uh, to do but most of the things i do are all through a browser one of the weird stats that i trophies claims to fame whatever it is of being microsoft employees i've never opened outlook in the nearly nine years i've been here so i do everything in in the web browser and so you know we're not, you know, obviously time is important uh, so sorry, this is a web browser. Again, try to keep it pretty small. These are the three calendars, Mail and, and Yammer on the websites. I, I start with most days and then obviously the Teams app, I also open up as well. But everything starts in my calendar because again, I think time is the most important thing we have. And so every day before I open up any mail, any Yammer or chats, always come to my calendar and see what's on for the day. Uh, you can see here I have uh, blended my work and personal calendar here. I have blocked out focus time for certain things to work on. I'm also pretty strict about when people can organize meetings with me. So I block out all after hours times, um, basically before 6 a.m., usually after three, but now that I'm home, all the time I've extended that to four for the time being. And I'll talk a bit about how I do all that stuff automatically without having to worry too much about the shallow work. Generally what I do, and I've You'll see these pink boxes. I'm just covering up stuff because, this, like I said, this is my real thing and trying to protect the innocent. So I have my task list, which I'll come. I'll see what I need to do for the day, and I will click and drag these on to usually over the focus time because it's blocked out. Or if I need to put it somewhere else, I'll do that too. That just allows me to make sure that I'm spending quality time doing the things I need to do, and I'm doing the tasks that I need to do as opposed to responding to other and reacting to other people's things, which is something that we get constantly held back in, and certainly in terms of shallow work, um, can really be a, a time suck. Uh, in terms of how I set up my calendar, uh, it's important, I think, to set up your working hours because this feeds a lot of other systems, particularly in Microsoft 365. So I do things like set up my working hours between six and three. Um, and I also, I make every meeting an online meeting just because I think it makes sense. You can record it. You can add people to it if you need to. And, and mostly because I'm remote, it makes the most sense. I, I try to stick to this pretty religiously too. This goes back to one of those first rules about being aggressive about how you spend your time. So any meeting that's less than uh, an hour, it ends five minutes early and any meeting over an hour, I end 10 minutes early. And I try and spend that 10 minutes taking any tasks that I had or actions from that we don't need to do or cleaning up or even just you know, running to the bathroom so I can start the next hour on time. 
again, you know, I've had, you know, mixed results, but certainly trying to build that habit and enforcement is um, is really hard to, really important to do, even though it's a little bit hard. Um, the bookings calendar, now I'm not sure if everyone has access to this, but certainly it's been a lifesaver just in terms of people able to book time with me. So basically what I, I've done is I can set up, I've set up 15 minute, 30 minute and 60 minute blocks. And then it creates this public page, this is a public facing page. So you can come here and I've put this in my signature and some teams and other things. So anyone can come in here, decide how long they want to spend time with me and they can find out you know, what they can maybe cover, what I can cover in that time, pick the day they want to speak and it will show available time so they have to book and that will just automatically schedule a meeting with me and you know, with what they want to do. And I found this really useful um, because Basically, I don't have to go. People don't have to ask me, are you free here? Are you free there? I'm like, just look at my bookings calendar and find some time. This is also, I don't know if everyone has this. Uh, I used to just use a share calendar, like an iCal event or something, and import all my calendar, my personal stuff. But there's a new, a new feature I noticed at least where I can connect my personal calendar. And when it brings it in to my work one, it actually makes these, it respects the free busy times, which has been incredibly helpful at the moment with um, my daughter's schooling, where I can put in all her classes and then this will show busy for anyone who's trying to book time with me. So that's worked out, uh, that's worked pretty well. I'm not sure if everyone has that yet, but certainly I found that really valuable. The other thing is this focus time block. So instead of trying to come in and make sure you do this every week, because you'll forget, uh, using my analytics, you can actually automate that whole process and it will you can it will report on how you've done, which is less interesting. But what you can actually do is again, this is where the working hours come into it. You can see the respects your working hours, you can set them here, and then it will automatically create focus, a focus plan for you for the um, future two weeks, um, which is really useful. You can come in and move these around. The only thing that I found with it is it tends to find the first two hours available, and because I try and free up my morning so I can connect with my colleagues in the US. So I sometimes have to drag them down, but it works really well just to guarantee that each day I have dedicated time to focus on a task or you know, do some deep work uh, that I can do. So I really encourage you to do, to do that. Now, email, again, I like to keep it super, super simple. I don't have, I don't use folders or anything like that. I just have archive and delete. Um, I use a focus inbox and pretty much anything that lands in other I determine is not worth it, so I just delete those without really even looking at them. I try and spend a few mo a few times throughout the day in here, but because it's web-based, I don't get notifications. I don't have, I don't even know when I have new mail. It's only when I choose to go and look at it, and then I can triage those really quickly and come in. So this is from yesterday, and I had I think four messages that I need to get done. What I do is, if I have a message that needs an action. I can drag it over here to the to-do list and then I can drag it back into my calendar when I want to get it done or I can just archive it and delete it if I don't need it. Um, in terms of helping schedule meetings with other people, there's a couple of tools I think are really useful. One is find time. I, again, I think most people have this. I'm not sure, but it's great where you can basically add a bunch of people to the two and then you use find time. It sends them out basically voting options. They vote and once a consensus gets hit, it will automatically schedule the meeting for you. Um, uh, so that helps a lot of back and forth, a lot of that shallow work where you're sort of going round and round and round. The other one that we have is this Cortana calendar.help. I'm pretty sure this is also public, but effectively you can add Cortana to an email and say, hey, can you schedule some time for us? And then in the background, a bot will go through and try and find um, certain things, certain times in us. It, it works okay. I found it struggles a little bit with different time zones, but it's just another option, um, which is which is useful. Um, if I come over to Teams, again, I am pretty diligent in how I organize my teams. I think I'm a member, I counted just before this, something like 80, 90 teams, which is far too many. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I keep the ones that mean the most to me and I need to be across of the most uh, above what I would call above the fold. Everything else gets hidden. And um, the, the thing I really want to call out here is I set my status to include that booking uh, link. So basically, if you ever send me a message or I'm part of a team chat, you'll get a little thing saying, hey, not getting a response from me, book a time to chat. And this this works really well, particularly because I'm in different time zones where people will send me, send me a chat, I'm not there, so I'll book some time and make sure they get me later or I can respond later. So that's another area where you can use that. Uh, actually, if I go back to that email too, I did include that in my signature there too. So that, that one is a really good one. And then the other one I think is interesting is when I'm doing meetings, this is where I talked about the webcam. 
Um, putting the webcam on during meetings, obviously now it makes more sense because everyone's remote, but even before this, I find forces me to focus on what's happening. I can't wander off and do other things. And you know, you can tell when someone's reading their email um, in a call. So I think having the camera on puts, not only is it nice for someone to put a face to the name and see you can actually get a lot from their physical gestures, but I think um, it also makes you focus on what's happening in that meeting. And if that meeting's available, then leave it uh, and record it, that type of thing. But that video I think is super important. Yammer, again, I don't spend huge amounts of time in Yammer. I try and focus a couple of times a day where I'll go in. I spend most of my time making sure my inbox is cleared. Make sure, if anything, I've, any conversation I'm part of or need to be a part of, I watch. There's only two or three groups that I really make sure I they don't have any that I own and have to answer, and I'll go and do that every couple of days. I do have a nice little, I guess, hack or workaround. So if there's a conversation here that um, I need that looks like I need to do some work on or generate a task. I'll share that into a group I created called Yammer to do private group. No one else is in it. And I just put a little message in, and then the um, and it has the shared conversation in it. And then what that does is I've set up a flow or power automate now to basically pick up any message in that group and add it to do for me. And then that will land in my to do list, which again, yeah, between my tasks and my calendar. Uh, pretty religiously uh, live by those. So then they'll appear in there and I can drag those into my calendar and make sure that I, I get stuff done in the right amount of time. Uh, so yeah, that was pretty whirlwind, but it's really just about making all those little things I showed you then is really just freeing up my time so then I can focus on stuff that I really want to get done and do well at and, and spend that time doing deep work and try and minimize that shallow work we spoke about uh, at the start. So with that, I know we're getting close to time. I just want to quickly, hopefully you get a sense and you're intrigued by deep work. I, again, I'd really encourage you to read that book or at least visit his website. And I'll send some links out at the end of this uh, that you can visit because he's done lots of podcasts about it too. But, you know, I've really, I think, better from it, and I guess it's still a journey for me, so I'd love to speak to other people about how they're going through this. Like I said, the super I, I really do believe it's a superpower, um, and I want to get better and better at it because I can only see good things coming. Uh, being able to focus without distraction for me is something that's very hard, but the more I practice, uh, hopefully the better I'll get at it, particularly with times like this. And, you know, again, I want to be, I want to be able to, you know, do complex things and and do them faster and better than I could before. Because I think this is, in terms of career, this is what sets you apart from the rest. You don't want to just be doing shallow tasks uh, every day because, you know, there's no sense of, of fulfillment there either. So, you know, this is for me the reasons why I do it. Uh, hopefully you saw a little bit about how. Um, and yeah, like I said, I'd, I'd love to carry that conversation on after. So here's the code again to win a prize. Um, and then big thank you, obviously, to our sponsors putting this on to Lorian and Megan and uh, Rebecca and everyone else has been involved. Certainly thank you for inviting me into this. I've really enjoyed it. Hopefully you, you know you like my story. And yeah, I'm happy to take I think we've got 10 minutes. I'm happy to take questions or anything like that. I must admit I have not been looking at any of the question boxes. So let me come into the event and see what's happened here. Okay, so we've got some questions from Daryl for my support. Thank you, Daryl. Good to see. Thank you for the top draw comments, Beck. I uh, clearly have an issue with that one. Uh, any suggestions of Cal Newport's three books? Um, order of reading. I would put them in the order I shared. So um, it was the First one about being so good you can't be ignored, then deep work, then I would do digital um, minimalist. I think they all go together quite nicely. Um, Daryl's impressed by how much I've reduced distractions. Thank you, sir. Anonymous had a great story. Thank you for sharing and some good feedback. Yeah, so again, thank you, everyone. Um, you won't obviously find me on social media, <laughs> but I'm sure you can get me LinkedIn or my email. Um, you'll, you know, if you're a local, I'm sure we'll cross paths at events somewhere. But um, I'd love to hear your story too at some point. But uh, yeah, if that's it, I will.
I'll stick around for a bit longer. If anyone has any questions, I'll put in and I'll, and I'll reply to these as we go as well.